Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate, or you can go to buy me a cup of coffee slash Craig U. All of these links are also in my show notes. And for people who donate, I have various levels of benefits. For $5, you get a thank you at the start of the next episode of Canadian History X, Canada's Great War, and from John to Justin, and on social media. For $10, you get everything from the $5, plus this episode is sponsored by, with your name at the start. Also, I'll state it's sponsored by you on social media. For $20, everything from the $5 and $10, plus a second episode sponsored by you, and promotion of something you're working on. And for $50, everything from the $5, $10, and $20 plus, you get to choose a topic for me to cover on Canadian History X. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. Just go to my username, Bairdo37. And you can find weekly videos on Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. If you want to find transcripts of every episode I've ever done, you can go to my website, CanadaEHX.com. And there's over 700 posts on Canada's history there. Now this episode, I'm looking at Joan Bamford Fletcher. And unfortunately, I hope to find a lot more about her. But after 1951, there's very little... And there's not even much when she dies. So I tried to get as much as I could. Unfortunately, it's a shorter episode than what I like. But it's interesting, and she has a great story. So let's dive in. The Second World War made many heroes that are remembered to this day in Canada. Generally, our military history tends to focus on the lives of men who fought for their country. But there were thousands of women who did their part. Today, I'm looking at one of those women. Joan Bamford Fletcher. Fletcher was born in Regina on July 12, 1909, to British immigrants who owned a successful cotton business. As a child, she would be sent to England to boarding school and would attend further schooling in Belgium and France. Comfortable around horses, when she was on the family ranch, she could often be found training horses. As an adult, she returned to Regina and began working at the office of the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration while helping her father raise horses. When she was 30, the Second World War broke out and Fletcher began working as a driver for the Canadian Red Cross. She would also study motor mechanics at the Saskatchewan Auxiliary Territorial Service. In 1941, Fletcher, using her own funds, traveled to Britain and it was there she would join the first aid nursing Euromanry. She would be stationed in Scotland, driving cars and ambulances for the exiled Polish army. By the spring of 1945, the war was drawing to a close and Fletcher would be reassigned to Southeast Asia. Arriving in Calcutta in April 1945, she then took a hospital ship across the Bay of Bengal and sailed towards Singapore. Due to the fact the ship had to go slowly through waters filled with mines, she would not reach Singapore until September 2nd, after the Pacific War was finished. During the war, 130,000 civilians, mostly Dutch, had been imprisoned by the Japanese. Many died from malnutrition and disease, and those who survived were weak for months and years at the camp. Fletcher would then travel to prison camps to help the internees who were sick. Promoted to the rank of lieutenant, she was appointed as the assistant to the brigadier in command. In October, Fletcher was assigned to Indonesia to evacuate a civilian internment camp. At these camps, the internees had been subjected to starvation, forced labor and torture, and diseases such as malaria were common. Arriving at the Bankinang camp, she found 2,000 prisoners, mostly women and children, in very poor condition. It was her job to transport them to safety at Padang. Unfortunately, the Allies had no personnel in the area, and Indonesian nationalists were taking advantage of the power vacuum left by the surrender of the Japanese in August. On August 17th, Indonesia declared independence and rebel groups were common throughout the country, where they took many Dutch prisoners. Fletcher would approach the commanders of the Japanese 25th Army and persuade them to provide her with 15 trucks, 40 armed soldiers, and an interpreter. Salvaging broken-down trucks she helped repair, she increased her convoy size to 25 trucks. Fletcher would say, quote, 
it shook the Japanese a bit to find themselves under the command of a woman. End quote. Things got off to a rough start when the ferry that would need to be used at the start of the journey had no engine. To fix this, a long cable was stretched across the river and a young man would pull the ferry along the current towards the shore. The journey from the camp to Padang was not an easy one. It was 450 kilometers through the jungle, across mountains, and with only 25 trucks, she could only move a small number of internees at one time, and each trip would take 20 hours to do. Fletcher would monitor each convoy going back and forth to deal with barricades, bridges that had been sabotaged, and road conditions that were hazardous to say the least. While traveling with the third convoy, her coat became caught in the wheel of a passing truck, and she was dragged under it, causing her to sustain a four-inch gash on her scalp. She was aided by the Japanese physician, and two hours later she was back managing the convoy. This incident would earn her the respect of the Japanese soldiers traveling with her, who now saluted her whenever she passed. Fletcher would say, quote, From there the Japanese couldn't do enough for me. My interpreter told me they had discussed that night, and he said he would like me to know I had won the respect of every man on the convoy, but they decided they would never marry a European woman. They were too tough. End quote. For over 150 years, Canada has had a deep and fascinating military history. From our troops' first steps abroad during the Boer War, to our coming of age during the First World War, to the leading role, but often ignored, role that we played in the Second World War. All of this is explored in On This Day in Canadian History. This series is hosted by Brad St. Croix, who has a PhD in military history and his videos are informative and fascinating. Using historic footage to provide context and insight about historical events, he also conducts live stream interviews with historians and others about topics that relate to our country's military history. If you have an interest in Canada's fascinating military history, then On This Day in Canadian Military History is the channel you need to subscribe to. Visit www.youtube.com slash c slash otd Canadian Military History or Click the link in my show notes to learn all about Canada's fascinating history when it comes to our military. The trips became worse when the monsoon season arrived, turning roads that were merely paths in the jungle into bogs. The rebels continued to barricade their path, so Fletcher had a car in the front be fitted with a special bumper to crash through the barricades. Eventually, British troops arrived and Fletcher could have turned over the operation to them. Brigadier General Peter Hutchinson told her she could stay in charge if she wanted to, and he would cover her on the condition that headquarters not find out. In the end, she chose to stay in charge of the convoy, and she focused on working with the Japanese. By the final convoy, there were 70 Japanese soldiers assigned, with several using mounted machine guns on trucks, and through all of this, Fletcher did not carry a firearm. But on the second last trip, Fletcher and a Japanese officer were leading the convoy in a jeep at the front, after fixing a tire, she found that two Dutch passengers in the lead car were missing, and a rebel was trying to steal the vehicle. She yelled out at the rebel, who jumped out of the vehicle and ran away. The interpreter and Fletcher then found the two Dutch internees with three armed rebels. The interpreter attempted to pass the Dutch internees off as British, but Fletcher began screaming at the rebels, then took out a knife, cut the captives from their restraints, and took them out the door. The rebels, taken aback by her display, did not pursue. Fletcher would say, quote, I was yelling at the top of my voice to keep up my courage, but they didn't understand a word of it. I added color by cursing a blue streak. End quote. Over the course of six weeks, she oversaw the transportation of 2,000 internees through 21 trips. At the end of the evacuation, the captain of a Japanese transport company that had provided vehicles gave Fletcher a 300 year old samurai sword, which was a family heirloom. Fletcher would ensure that the unit that helped her, the Yamashita Butai, were exempt from serving a year of hard labor, which most Japanese soldiers were sentenced to after the war. In November of 1945, Fletcher was then in Hong Kong, but three weeks later came down with swamp fever. She would return to England in July 1946, but the disease returned, and she would lose half her lower teeth and part of her jaw, which was replaced with plastic. In 1946, Fletcher was then named a member of the Order of the British Empire for her services in Southeast Asia. Upon hearing of the award, she would state, quote, My, it was a surprise, end quote. In 1947, Fletcher arrived in Poland to work with the information section of the British Embassy at Warsaw. She was assigned the post because she could speak Polish thanks to her time with the Polish Army in Scotland, and she would remain there until 1950 when she received a call that the secret police were after her. Fletcher would say, quote, 
No reason was given, but later, after I had been flown to London in an RAF courier plane, I learned that my arrest by the Communist secret police had been arranged. End quote. The incident was in retaliation to her association with Captain Claude Turner, a British air officer who was jailed 18 months on claims of helping a Polish woman leave the country. Her final week in Warsaw, Poland was one of the worst of her life, she would say, stating, quote, My last week in Warsaw was a nightmare, escaping the communist dragnet by six hours, end quote. Fletcher would say the entire incident was trumped up by the Soviets, and she would add, quote, The story about the Polish girl is just propaganda. The secret police are recruited from sadists and perverts, end quote. In truth, she would say she was targeted for helping three Britons involved in a dispute with Polish authorities. She burned her address book and left the country on a Royal Air Force plane. She would say, quote, I went through the customs with a nightdress, a toothbrush, and six aspirins I had swallowed to hold my stomach down. I was a nervous wreck. I didn't carry anything that would give them an excuse to hold me. I'm looking freedom in the face now for the first time in months, and I'm not going back. I'm glad to be going home to get as far away as I can from communism. End quote. Polish authorities would state that they had no intention of arresting her, and their statement would state, quote, the Polish authorities, however, had absolutely no intention of arresting Miss Fletcher. Court proceedings recently took place in Warsaw concerning a Mr. Claude Turner, who declared he had maintained a direct contact with Miss Fletcher in this respect. End quote. After leaving Poland, Fletcher came back to Canada and settled in Vancouver. She would keep in touch for the rest of her life with her Japanese interpreter, Art Miyazawa. She would pass away on April 30, 1979. After her death, Miyazawa wrote to Fletcher's sister and stated regarding a veteran's reunion Fletcher had attended, quote, Virtually every veteran present recalled the tough but fair-minded woman lieutenant who amazed our troops with her consummate knowledge and expertise in handling the assignment at hand, end quote. The Amashita Butai's honor roll of deceased veterans also includes the name of Fletcher. The sword she received, along with her war medals, are now on display at the Canadian War Museum. Unfortunately, Fletcher's name would mostly fall through the cracks of history until the 21st century. In 1998, a five-part television series was created to focus on women who served for Canada during the war. Independent moving pictures had to resort to putting a letter to the editor in a newspaper just to find relatives of Fletcher. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Joan Bamford Fletcher. Next week, we're looking at Canada and the death penalty. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to canadaehx.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobbs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Information from Legion Magazine, Canada War Museum, University of Saskatchewan, Wikipedia, Maclean's, Vancouver Province, Vancouver Sun, Regina Leader Post, and the Richmond Review. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.